uh, n minus one dimensional subvector space of kn unless all the f's are zero. In that case, the complete space is the solution set. No, and in a second step, we looked, we took a geometric object, say, and now we consider functions, differentiable functions, algebraic functions, on this uh, topological space or uh, manifold or whatever. No, and then we can form the set um, consisting of all no, base point and variables T1 up to Tn with the property that the sum Fi P inserted times Ti is zero. No, and this gives uh, an object, a geometric object above X and uh, P is the base point. No, and the fibers, uh, as soon as one of the Fi does not vanish at P, the fiber will be an minus one dimensional uh, space. And, uh, but in general, it will happen that the Fi's have a common zero and there the fiber goes up. No, so it looks something like that. Here you have, say, say n, is, n is two, then it looks like that, that then suddenly at a point where the all uh, functions vanish, uh, the dimension will go up. No, and that makes it more complicated. So usually we, strict, we restrict to the open subset outside the locus where all the functions vanish. No, and then we have a constant uh, dimension of the fibers and then say be restricted to u over u is then a vector bundle. Oh, and in the, yeah, in, the, in the case of commutative algebra, our functions are now elements inside the ring. And uh, we look at the CCG module of these elements, which uh, live inside... Oh, best thing is to express it with a um, short exact sequence. I is the ideal generated by these elements. This is just the kernel, no? and the map is just given by, uh, by the matrix given by these uh, elements. No, and again, this is only a module, but if we look at the... So X will now be the spectrum of R, and U is the subset where not all of the fi vanish. No, and if we look at the sheaf version of that, then we get here a vector bundle, so a locally free sheaf. No, this restricted to u, and then here we have the structure sheaf of uh, u n time, and if here we get the structure sheaf of, of u again once. No, and uh, Yesterday, I explained how, ah, and in the graded case, we get the same thing on the corresponding projective variety. No, and yesterday, I explained how to, how to uh, get results on Hilbert Kuhn's uh, theory by looking at properties of these vector bundles on the projective variety, in particular, in the situation where R is a two-dimensional ring and then the normal and then the variety is a smooth projective curve. No, that was what we did yesterday. Now today, um, no, so this is a homogeneous linear equation. Now today, we do the more or less the same thing, but we make it a little bit more complicated. So the left-hand side of the equation is the same, but now on the right-hand side, we have another element, f. So this is an inhomogeneous linear equation in n variables. No, and you know how the solution uh, behavior is. No, and what we also learn in school, say if this is the solution space here, 
T is the solution space here. I mean, the sol solution space can be empty, but if it's not empty, then we can pick, or let's say, yeah, we have an action of the solution space of the homogeneous equation acting on the solution space of the inhomogeneous equation by just adding. No, in school we say no, solution to the homogeneous equation uh, plus uh, uh, a solution to the inhomogeneous equation gives a new solution to the inhomogeneous equation. No, and if we fix, if we fix a special solution, we even get an isomorphism. A bijection, say, better say a bijection, but this is not canonical. Not canonical. No, we cannot, uh, so the solution space is not a vector space here. Maybe we say solution set. Here the solution set is a space, vector space, here not. Now let's look on this level. Now we have, as before, we have our functions to k, so think of k as a complex numbers or whatever, but also f is now a function, and now we can uh, build the same thing, but here now we don't have zero, but we have the value of this extra function inside, uh, uh, inside the, at the point p, no, so that is now, maybe I write it with new variables, Oh, maybe it's the old variables. Oh, and now the condition is just uh, fi p times ti has to be equal to f, no, this function at the point p. No, and the image is more or less the same. The only new thing is that the, the, the fiber might be, um, might be empty. No, but still, basically, the image looks the same. No, so, so the fibers, yeah, the fibers are still k to the power i. But for example, here you have a zero section. No, here you would have a zero section mapping every point to zero in each component. No, so you have here somehow the zero section. Here, in general, you do not have a section at all, or at least not a continuous section or algebraic section. No, there's no reason for that. So here we have very new uh, global properties, which might be interesting. No, and uh, again, we have uh, this action just by making, by looking at this action fiber-wisely. No, so the this bundle acts on this guy. We will, we will soon give a name to, to that. No, and again, we don't like so much the, that the fibers may have a higher dimension for, for certain points, so usually we will restrict to the same open subset, and then we have uh, such an action just by addition. No, and uh, now here we have a vector bundle. Uh, oh, sorry, here's of course T. And, uh, and this guy, we will later give a definition. This is called a torsor, or a principal homogeneous bundle, or there are many, many of fiber, principal fiber bundle. There are many names for that. So I will usually say torsor. That's from a French school, I would say. Um, okay. No, and now in the algebraic setting, we just, no, we have still our n elements, and we have an extra element, r, and um, this sequence is as before, nothing happens, so what can we do with f? No, and we will see that, so we are basically then interested in the question whether f belongs to the tight closure of the ideal, the ideal is still given by the n functions, and we are interested, we have now an extra function, an extra element of the ring, does it belong to the tight closure of the ideal generated by the given functions? No? And we will present 
in fact, several uh, representations of this, uh, of this uh, problem, of this uh, question, where an element belongs to the tight closure of an ideal uh, in terms of this, of this torso. No? So this is a geometric interpretation of uh, the in inclusion problem for tight closure in terms of torsos over yeah, over the, uh, an open subset of the spectrum. That is basically what we are doing uh, today. So, yeah, let's give um, the scheme theoretic definition of a torsor. So, where do I have it? I changed a little bit my... Uh, just to, to make clear uh, what we are talking about. So we have a scheme, I call now the base scheme again X, but uh, it's rather this U, no, but later on it will be the, the brush. So let's have a neutral uh, letter X, and we have a geometric Vector bundle, no, that's the geometric version of a locally free sheaf. Geometric vector bundle. So you, you should really think, no, maybe we draw the base is one dimensional and no, we have here. For each point we have a vector space of fixed dimension R, which is called the rank, and uh, Locally, it looks like an affine space over the base, and the transition map is a linear. That's, that's important. No? So, in particular, we have an addition here on the vector bundle. And um, then the definition is a scheme T over the base X is called an a V torso, no, if we have an action over the base X uh, to T, and, uh, yeah. and the point is locally this action should look like the action of the vector bundle on itself. No? And uh, open Union X is the union of UIs in a certain index set, no, and uh, identity no, uh, scheme isomorphisms from T restricted to UI to V restricted to UI, such that the following diagrams commute. No, so, no, I mean from that you, you just restrict. You go to U. I, I don't write UI. I just write U. No, but this must be true for all UI. No, you have this thing. And then, no, you have here, you go down to the vector, but so that's a U, that's a V. And here you have also this thing. No, and downstairs you just have the addition in the vector bundle. And uh, here you have phi I, oh, phi. And here you have, uh, no, I mean here the identity and uh, phi. No, and that, that has to commute. No, so here this is the action of the vector bundle on that. And uh, yeah, so local, no, the point is locally it looks like the action of the vector bundle on itself. But only locally. That does not mean any global statement. So. Globally, uh, it's not a vector bundle. You don't have addition. You don't have zero section on T. No, it's a more complicated object. Okay. Um, and, uh, yeah, this, um, so, the torsos are, so how do you, 
classify torso. And um, the main point is that uh, it's given by the first cohomology of the vector bundle. So say x is a scheme, maybe you need separated scheme or something. Uh, and uh, you have our vector bundle. And maybe I, usually I identify vector bundles with, with locally free sheaves. Here I want to be, because here it's really important that it's a geometric object. Uh, I want to be clear. So here we take the sheaf of sections in V, which is the corresponding locally free sheaf. No? And then there is a chorus correspondence between, uh, so on one side we have, uh, oh, maybe I don't need a bracket, um, V torsos, like that, and uh, the first cohomology, sheaf cohomology inside the sheaf of sections. No? Now, so for example, over an affine scheme, every torso is, is trivial. Is, and trivial means here is the vector bundle. But usually you have cohomology, no, and I denote, so here we have a class, and the corresponding torso we uh, denote like that. No? And uh, no, the easiest, so, so I, I will not give the proof, but think of you, you represent your, your cohomology class, first cohomology class, by a Czech, uh, as a Czech cohomology class, and there you have uh, transition mappings, and out of these you construct T. No? No, and the point may be here, I've said uh, for the vector bundle situation, I said somewhere that the transition mappings are linear. Here, the transition mappings are only a fine linear. So you have a linear, but also you allow shifts. That, that's the only difference. No? Okay, so we have this um, representation. Another nice uh, interpretation of this object is, so we will get at least two nice interpretations. So, um, now if you look at this guy, now this has many interpretations, so here I look at the, now, I, it's always difficult to remember in which direction I have to go, I think, like that. No? So you have uh, um, this identification, x1 is the, the sheaf cohomology, x1 where, where in the first uh, entry is, is the structure sheaf, and, no, but this you can really interpret as uh, extension, and as an extension, so now let's fix the class here, consider the class here, we look at the corresponding extension, and no, then everything turns around. Uh, no, you have a short exact sequence, and in the middle, no, the, the, the object in the middle together with this mapping constitutes the extension. No, and uh, the thing is made in such a way that if you look at the global one here, this will be mapped under the connecting homomorphism of sheaf cohomology to this class. No, so one, no, one, no, if you look at the long exact sequence or the starting point, no, you have here this. Uh, usually denoted by delta, one is mapped uh, to the class you are representing by a torso. And uh, now we look, so S is our vector bundle we start with, S prime is also vector bundle because it's in between two vector bundles, and uh, for so we consider it as, uh, maybe it's, uh, I do the 
I go back to my vector bundle notation. So we have a, a vector bundle of rank, say if V has rank R, uh, this has rank R plus one, and we have a vector bundle and a sub vector bundle of rank R. Here, rank R plus one. And here we look at the corresponding projective bundles. So this is exactly the process you do when you construct projective space. You start with a vector space and you look at all the lines going through the origin. But that you do now uh, point-wise. No, so here you, have, uh, oh, here you have your vector bundle. No, and now for each fiber, you look at the corresponding projective space. No, so we get from this inclusion, it's a strict inclusion, we get that inclusion and now we look here it's a projective bundle inside a projective bundle core dimension one. And now we look here at the complement. Oh. oh, I don't know. No, so projective bundle. So, I mean, projective bundle, I draw like a, a fine space. No? But here you have your sub bundle, no? and now you look, so point-wise, you look at, say, P, no, the dimension has gone down by one, so we have here the, uh, the R-dimensional projective space without some linearly embedded R minus one projective space, and that you have in every fiber. That's this object. No, and this object, no, therefore you can say the fiber the fibers of this object over every point is an affine space again, because no projective space minus a projective linear hyper uh, surface hyperplane is just uh, a fine space. No, so we know immediately that the fibers here over the base are affine spaces, and this is one interpretation of the torso. No, very. So you can choose. Either you do here Czech cohomology, you construct a torso, or you, you know what the extensions are, and from the extensions you go this way, and then you get the torso. No, the main point is you have a, a cohomology class is represented by, uh, by a, a geometric object, a torso. No? Okay. Now, I, we've said that we want to look at this situation. So we want to understand that as a, a torso. And uh, so there are several ways to do it. Maybe the easiest thing, if you look at that, no, we have, on one hand, we have our CCGs, F1 up to Fn, and now we just consider the new element F as, a, as the next element, and this, this again gives us CCGs. No? So we have here, not just by uh, the, the, so the last new coefficient will be just zero. That is this map, so Fn, but then also F. No, and then... Uh, it goes to O by, by uh, just looking at the last component, and uh, no, we have such a sequence. And in fact, no, this looks like that. And uh, so that, if you go through this construction, you get, um, on the spectrum of the ring, you get um, also the torso. No, so as soon as you have uh, a set of ideal generators and the next new element, you will get a torso which uh, puts together all this information. And so that's one way to do it. Another way, maybe yeah, a little bit more direct, I would say, is to look at uh, so-called forcing algebras. So, so this is a construction of Hoxter done in the context of solid closure. I will come to that. So we have our ring. We have n elements. 
I mean, it sounds stupid if I say we have n elements and another element. <laughs> but I could say we have n plus one elements, but the role of the elements is very different. No? And f elements in the ring. And now we, for, um, we form the following algebra. So we adjoin for each element, for each generator, a variable. T1 up to Tn. And now we mod out just one equation. No, and that looks familiar. Basically, we take this equation. And now we can discuss, do we like a plus or a minus? That is, uh, no, we have to decide. Uh, today I write plus. And then if I say something like it it's corresponds to the torsor, it might be true that it's only true up to a sign. But that doesn't change much. No? So plus or minus is uh, no, very nice. Very nice algebra, very easy. So what does this algebra do? No, it's the, it has a universal property. In this algebra, f belongs to the ideal generated by f1 up to fn. But you do not know anything about the coefficients because the coefficients are variables. No, and so as soon as you have any R algebra where uh, in the extended ideal f belongs, to the extended ideal, it will factor through the forcing algebra. No, that's a, but not uniquely. Here we have a bit, uh, be a bit careful. So that's a universe, uh, that's the forcing algebra. That's an R algebra. And uh, if we look at the corresponding morphism of the spectra, this will be uh, this will be the map from, from T to the base. So here we have, in general, higher dimensional fibers. The fibers are not constant in that situation. No? Um, no, you can write down whatever you want to if you want to have a concrete uh, example. I, I, I will give some examples later. Now, so this is a so-called forcing algebra. And... Um, to get the relation with the torsors is that so if, if we again go, u is again the union of the DFIs, and if we restrict the spectrum of the forcing algebra to u, then, so that is also a proposition, uh, this is a model for the torsor given by yeah given by f in this case. Now, and the torsor given by f, we have either you do it in that way, or we go back. Um, to this sequence, oh, I write it down again. So I write down the, the version on uh, U. So here we have OUN goes to OU, no, short exact sequence of um, globally free sheaves, and not because it's a short exact sequence, we have here, um, we have here, um, we can look at the long exact sequence of cohomology, no, and an element F is an element in R, and this goes, this is a global section here. No, and now we go by global evaluation, no, um, this gives a cohomology class by the connecting homomorphism inside, no, first cohomology class inside the open subset of the CCG bundle. 
No? And as it is a cohomology class, by uh, this theorem, it gives a torsor where the CCGs act on. And, uh, but this you can also realize directly uh, in that sense. Well, so many things uh, come together. And it's good to have uh, all these uh, possible interpretations. So, No, I yeah. should quickly remind you of the definition of uh, tight closure. So we have a domain, so I restrict to a domain. And we have an ideal, so in positive, containing a field of positive characteristic. And then we say F belongs to the tight closure of I if and only if there exists. Now, most people would write here a C, but for the, for the multiplicator in tight closure theory. But C is my cohomology class. So I don't write C, I write Z. So Z, not zero. No, I assume the main and Z to the power FQ belongs to the I to the bracket Q. No? That's the definition. And. Uh, Um, okay, so what has that to do with the forcing algebra? So in general, forcing algebras, and, and really in that sense, are a, a very good tool to study closure uh, properties of ideals or of modules in general um, by looking at corresponding properties of this map. No, so now the question is, uh, F belonging to the tight closure, how do you see it in this map? For example, just to give you a, a very uh, a, a glimpse, when does the element F belongs to the ideal in the ring itself? That's the case if and only if you have a section here. And of course, then uh, other properties will be, other closure operations will have a more complicated uh, interpretation. But here we concentrate uh, on uh, tight closure, and uh, so here the statement is tight closure is solid closure, but now we have to say, of course, what, what does that mean? So it means that F belongs, so let's say R is normal, normal excellent domain, I think a local and uh, then we say, or then the statement is F belongs uh, to the, ah, uh, and I, I is M primary ideal. Then we have that this is equivalent to the statement that, so let D be the dimension of R, that the local cohomology with support in M of the forcing algebra is not zero. Well, this is definitely surprising at first, first glance. No. In particular, on the right-hand side, you do not have any, any positive characteristic. But uh, one should say that in, uh, in, in characteristic zero, if dimension is, is larger than three, or starting with three, this does not give uh, a tight closure type theory. So it's uh, still one should think of this as a statement in positive characteristic. Um, no, and the, so if you look at this, this basically means, I mean you have downstairs, the local cohomology of R, you know that it's not zero by Rotendick theorem, no, if D is the dimension. And uh, do you have a natural map to A? No, and then the question is, so here, no, we have said yesterday, tight closure, it should be tightly uh, to, to the ideal. 
So if you smash f into the ideal, and that is what the forcing algebra does, it should not change too much. And for example, so this theorem says it doesn't change that this local cohomology is non-zero. No, it's still non-zero. No. No, so, so the converse is uh, if f is not inside the tight closure, then the cohomological dimension of the, to of, of, uh, the local cohomological height, I should say, drops. No, it goes down then. And uh, so in particular, ah, and uh, so if the dimension is at least two, we can, uh, we have an isomorphism with uh, sheaf cohomology. So the, the cohomological degree goes down by one. And U is again the punctured spectrum. No? So the question is, uh, uh, this is, uh, is upstairs, so I should write it like that. No? It's a pre-image of the punctured spectrum, no? where everything is locally free. No? And uh, now for D being 2, Dimension of the ring being two, no? and yesterday at the end we could all, all only prove something in dimension two, and that will be the same here. D being two, um, here we have then a one, and then the question is, or then it translates, I is uh, inside the tight closure, if and only if um, E M A. No, of course, MA is not the maximal ideal in, a, in the forcing algebra anymore. But it's an open subset in the spectrum of the uh, forcing algebra. And if this subset is not affine, not affine, also in the sense, not a fine scheme, it's not isomorphic to the spectrum of a ring. No, so the situation, yeah, let's draw it. Of course, downstairs, if we, uh, the punctured spectrum in dimension two uh, is not affine. It's quasi-affine, not affine. But now we look at this forcing algebra. No, so the DMA is the complement of the exceptional fiber. And this might be affine or not affine. No, and that characterizes uh, tight closure. OK. Um, so now I should go into the direction of uh, results, what we can do with that, what kind of uh, characterization we can give. I guess we started some, some minutes past nine, but not many, maybe two or three minutes after nine. Yeah, let's get rid of everything. So now for the rest of the talk today, R will be normal two-dimensional standard graded over, say, a, a field of positive, algebraically closed field of positive characteristic. No? And uh, I will be primary to the maximal ideal of the standard graded, homogeneous maximal ideal of the standard graded ring. And uh, we fix ideal 
homogeneous ideal generators of degree d1 up to dn, and we have another element homogeneous of degree n. No, and this gives, uh, ah, and uh, C will be the corresponding smooth projective curve. And um, now we saw yesterday that then we have, uh, again, same notation but different object. Now we have... Uh, This CCG bundle on the curve going to OC, and if we twist it again by M, no, no, if we twist it by M, we get here an M, we get here an M. Now, and then our element F defines a global section here. And then by the connecting homomorphism, uh, delta F gives us a first cohomology class inside the CCG bundle in the twist M. And then it gives you, no? so these data, because it's a cohomology class, gives a Let's denote this by S, gives an S torsor over the curve. Also, we have here our nice smooth projective curve. We have here our torsor. And then we want to know, is the torsor an affine scheme? Huh? If it's a vector bundle, it's not an affine scheme. No? Then we have a section, the zero section, and then we have a projective curve inside, and uh, a fine scheme, scheme cannot contain projective curves. In fact, that is a very, but that I will talk tomorrow, the question when does this torso contain projective curves? No? That is tomorrow. So today I'm interested, when is this a fine or not a fine? A fine scheme. No? And uh, as yesterday, so it's more natural to ask this question a little bit more general. So we have, not because again we want to use the hardener neuron simran filtration or the strong hardener neuron simran filtration of that guy, and in that the, the filtering objects will not be CCGs anymore. So it's, it's better to write from the beginning, say we have a locally free sheaf on our curve, we have a cohomology class, and uh, we build the torso, and we ask, is it an affine scheme or not? That's the question. No, and uh, so, number. Let's come to the results, so this situation, and uh, so this has a lot to do with the degree of S. Um, so, let's say TC oh, is an affine scheme. Ah. Yeah. So this is for the case and then you reduce to that case in general. So theorem, if S is uh, strongly semi-stable, um, um, doo -doo -doo -doo. strongly semi-stable, uh, then uh, the torso is a fine if and only if the degree of S is negative and, I mean, if the, if the class is zero, no, it can never be a fine because then it's the vector bundle and then it has the, a section and then it's not a fine. So, but it can also happen, but this is rather exception that it's not zero 
in negative degree, but some Frobenius pullback. Uh, is zero. So I, I write it down. So that would be the version in characteristic zero. No. It's a fine if and only if the degree is negative and the class is non-zero. That's the in, in characteristic zero. And in, uh, in um, positive characteristic, we have, uh, we need the condition that the class is not annihilated by the Frobenius. But this is in negative degree, it might happen, but it's rather an exception. And if you are in a relative family, it's uh, for almost all prime number, this does not occur. But it's a, that is a, 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 subtility, a subtle, subtlety. Okay. Um, so here we have uh, so what goes into this. So we have results of uh, Hartron and uh, Giesecker about ampleness of vector bundles. Maybe I don't say more to that. Um, yeah, let's write down already the, what does that mean for tight closure? And yeah, I think I, I finished then by only doing the strongly semi-stable case, so I will do the general case uh, tomorrow. Now, we go back to this situation, and now suppose that for some reason we know that the CCGs are, the CCG module is strongly semi-stable. That's an assumption here, which is in general not true, but as I said already, by going to the strong hard or similar filtration, we can reduce it to the strong semi-stable case. No, and then what does the right-hand side says? It only says that the degree of the CCGs has to be negative. But the degree we can compute by looking at the sequence, the degree of, of that guy here. No, and then we get the result that so if, so the degree of F is again M, now then we have so it's two statements. If M, so this I call the degree formula for uh, tight closure. Now you take just the sum of the degrees divided by N minus 1, which is the rank of the, of the CCG sheaf. Then F belongs to the tight closure of I. No? And uh, if M is below this bound, yeah, uh, then say F does not belong to the tight closure unless F is, uh, F is itself inside the ideal or I have to say that uh, F uh, belongs to the Rubinius closure. So, no, but this is a, a rare phenomenon. So, so morally, you should think of uh, you should think of like that. No, unless F belongs to the ideal itself. But uh, to be uh, exact, uh, it should be like 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 that. No, so here you have, and maybe one degree tuple which will be relevant in the last lecture is, say, so two elements is the parameter case easy. No, then it's just the sum of the degrees divided by one. So the next interesting case, and that is already complicated, is three elements. And... Uh, Say all three elements have degree four. Now then we have here 12 divided by two. So the degree bound is six. In six we have, in degree six we have interesting behavior. Now above six we know it's in the, at least if it's strongly semi-stable, 
it's in the tight closure. Below, it's not in the tight closure, unless it's in the ideal itself. But um, so here, just by the, by the statement itself, it will be inside. But if it isn't strongly semi-stable, then the interesting behavior is in degree 6. So everywhere, so for example, count example to localization problem will be of this degree type. Three generators of degree 4, one element of degree 6 behaving weirdly. No, all the other behaviors are, are quite uh, regular. But in this degree, if something can go wrong, then it will go wrong in this uh, degree type. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you.